Neil, how much descent fuel did you have left when you actually shut down? Um, my own instruments would have indicated uh, uh, less than 30 seconds, probably something like 15 or 20 seconds. I think the analysis of uh, uh, made here on the ground indicates uh, something more than that. Probably greater than 30 seconds, 40, 40 or 40. Are they lying? We're talking about the astronauts that landed on the moon in 1969. So today we're going to go over the body language of the three astronauts that made the first lunar landing in history. And a lot of people are saying they don't believe there was a moon landing. They don't think it happened. Let's find out. Greg, tell us about the videos we're going to watch. So the timeline for you, if you're not old enough to have been watching this, which some of us are, is the the ship took off, the Saturn V rocket took off on 16 July 1969, and they splash back down on the 24th of July, 1969. They're held in a quarantine for three weeks, which most people don't realize because we didn't know if there was any kind of germs in space. And then this occurred where they had a press conference with everybody in the world to ask questions and to hear a presentation. That's what we got. A number of of experts had prior to the flight predicted that a good bit of difficulty might be encountered by people attempting to work on this. This didn't prove to be the case and uh, after landing we felt very comfortable in the lunar gravity. Uh, it, it was in fact in, in our view preferable both to weightlessness and the Earth's gravity. This led us to believe, this in conjunction with the fact that all the systems in the limb were, were operating magnificently and we had very few problems, to uh, go ahead with the, with the surface work immediately. Uh, we predicted that we might be ready uh, to leave the limb by 8 o'clock, but those of you who followed on the ground recognize we missed our estimate by a good deal. This was due to a number of factors. Uh, one, we had uh, house cleaning to perform, uh, food packages, flight plans, and uh, all the items that we'd used in the previous descent to be stowed out of the way and prior to depressurizing the, the lunar module. Uh, it took longer to depressurize the lunar module than we had anticipated and it also took longer to get the cooling units in our backpacks uh, operating than, than we had expected. In sum and substance, it took us approximately an hour longer to get ready than, 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 we, would, than, than we had predicted. All right, Greg, what do you got? Let's first start talking about who these people are. They are Korean war vets, pilots, test pilots, engineers, all of them except for Collins, I believe, had an engineering degree. So these are people who are not given to a whole lot of fancy, probably, in their communication style. When they go and do test piloting, they come back and they write reports. We're going to hear a lot of that kind of talking because when a person talks in facts, that's how it is. We always think of pilots as somebody like, a you know, Top Gun. But pilots are all kinds of different people, and you just got to look for the right ones. I also read that Armstrong was picked specifically to be the first man to step on the moon because of his personality, because his ego would not explode. So they were very careful and even violated what was normal protocol that would say the second officer would get out first because of the way the doors were set. So there's a lot of stuff going on here. We'll pay attention to that. There's a little bit of sense of humor when he's talking about why we're about who they were and all that kind of thing. And he's telegraphing that they were played around a little bit more than they should have. I think this guy is not a guy given to fits of dancing around and playing around. Korean War vet, that era, this whole time frame, everybody, people were a little bit more stiff upper lip even in the U.S. in those days. And then you watch him having to go out and these guys literally are playing on the moon for a couple of hours. And it's clear they're playing and having a good time. And he lets that go when he's smirking about liking that gravity better. These guys were rock stars. These guys were not very flappable, but they're also going to have a very 
odd by our modern day communication style. And both Chase and I, both when we left the military, would tell you our communication style had to adapt to civilian life because we talk in different ways, very contained, very short, very seven word sentence driven. And all of that has to change over time. When you see this movement in Buzz Aldrin's mouth, I think it's just a habit. I think he's done it enough that it becomes kind of what he's doing. So right out of the gate, I'm thinking, OK, we don't see anything here that makes me think he's lying. Chase, what do you think? I think we owe it. I think what I think I should do in this video is play devil's advocate. And I'll maybe look, I'll very specifically look at some of the stress signals here. Where is, where's the stress? Where are the inconsistencies? Because I found a couple. And I want to I nail down on those. And I'll be that guy for this video. Uh, and just keep that in mind. So there is some fidgeting happening with Neil and Buzz. You can clearly see it in the video. And uh, Michael's even doing this kind of neck protecting thing where he's protecting his neck. And Neil has several uh, press conferences before this. So I feel like I owe it to you watching to have gone back and looked at all of these so that we at least had a grasp of his baseline. So here, uh, he he's not making much eye contact with the people in the room. And all of his other appearances before the mission, there was a nonstop eye contact with the press, with the people in the audience. And this is also something that's uh, about to occur with all three of them here in just a minute. And compared to the pre-launch press conference, if you want to call it that, before the launch, uh, the behavior that I'm seeing here is a, a lot more somber. And you watch this clip on mute. If you watch it on mute, it carries a heavy weight that feels like someone's been nominated to deliver some bad news. I know there's a theory out there that they look stressed because of stage fright or being in the public eye. If you watch the pre-mission press conference, you'll see there is a reduction in nervousness by about 90%. And I'll be honest, I've never watched these with the aim of uh, deciphering their behavior before. So this is brand new for me. And keep in mind that there's a difference. There is a big difference between resignation, reservation, stress, and what I might call covert defiance. So keep those terms in your mind as we're moving forward uh, with these and we break them all down. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so I haven't seen those other two interviews because so I've got nothing to kind of put against that other than, you know, maybe it's who's in the audience at these particular interviews. Later on, we're going to see somebody in British culture specifically, you know, very high up there, as big as you can get in terms of British astronomy. So is it the people in there? I just said, I don't know the answer to that. I'm just putting forward possibilities around this. But what do I see in this? Greg, to your point, there's a lot of pleasure to this idea of, of being judgmental, subjective and preferential as to the gravity in one place and the gravity in another place. I think there's a lot of pleasure in that. Number one, yeah, because mm. of that kind of messing around with that. But also... This is one of the only times that they actually anybody actually puts forward a, a preference that they you know they preferred this to that, and that's that's very engineering mindset. That why would you have a preference when there's just facts or nothing else? So lovely to to see that preference there. Um, you know they're outside of the the objective facts that an engineer, an analyst, or a pilot might have. And and look, the behaviours that I'm seeing from all three of them is not unusual for pilots that I've met, engineers, and analysts that I've been around. Very engineering mindset. Um, hey Chase, I've, I've come up with this idea. Instead of fidgeting, I think it's digital occupation. Digital occupation. Okay, just the hands just the hands doing stuff. I was like, what am I going to call this that isn't fidgeting? You know, because it'll cast a very negative idea if they're fidgeting. And I thought, if I call it digital occupation, then it'll sound, you know, very authoritative and people will go, Great. okay, just digitally occupied at that point. But again, that, that fidget spinning that's going on with whatever he has in his hand, and I can't make out what it is, is that unusual for 
engineers, for analysts, for no, not in my experience. They they will often have something else going on at the same time to occupy one section uh, of their mind. So look, I'm not, you know, from my point of view, I'm not particularly worried by what I see going on at the moment. But Scott, what do you got on this one? I, I agree with you, Mark. I, I was, I was, when I was a kid, I was really into the Apollo missions. I mean, I yeah. was, I have all these guys that have their autographs, I have them in their spacesuits, all that stuff. I had the GI Joe thing, you know, in, in the, uh, little Mercury, Mercury one capsule and all that. I got all that stuff. I was way into the, into, into astronauts and the whole Apollo thing. So for me, Chase, the upstairs <laughs> will be again, once again, battling. <laughs> <laughs> well, one of the down, one of the downstairs. <laughs> yeah, part of the downstairs. Upright's going to battle bottom left as we go through this. So for for me, and and going back to your going back to your point, Chase, where they where they look a lot more relaxed than the first one. This right now, the entire world is watching this press conference. Everybody's watching it because they're like, they're going to talk to these guys. We got to watch that. And this was back before you could binge watch stuff. You couldn't, there was no YouTube or anything. So everybody had to watch it one time and they did. And these guys know this. And we're, and we're talking about people who are, you know, these guys aren't out being, but they're, they're not, they're, they're not really social. Of the three, Buzz Aldrin is the most social nice. one. Yeah. He, he's, and so as, and even now you can see him out being social. If you, God. Chase, he might punch you. He might punch you if you disagree. <laughs> yeah, that's true. So I, I I think that's the difference we're, we're seeing here is it's it's three guys who've been in a um, a space capsule together for a long time, and then when they get out of that, I mean, gone to space, rack, nerves racked, man. I mean, they're thinking, well, we're going to die here in a few minutes because nobody's ever done this before. This is they're going to sit on top of this rocket, light it up, and then go to the moon. In 1969, are you kidding me? And it sounds crazy, but they, these guys are like, yeah, I'll do it. I'll do it. Sure. I'm, I'm, I'm in. Let's do this. Or please let me go. I'll, I'll do it. So that's what we're looking at, those personality types. And they're not very exciting at all. You know, especially Neil Armstrong. He's just a, a shy guy. He's just a shy person. And as when every word he speaks, everybody's looking right at him and, and, and paying attention to what he's saying. So I think we're seeing the behaviors of a shy person as the world turns around and goes, hey, what are you doing, man? Let's, let's, <laughs> let's all, everybody, let's watch this guy. So I think that's why he, why he looks that way. He's, he's, a, he's a bit wigged out. They're now the most famous people ever. These are the most famous people ever. And they peaked right here in this little section of time, being the most famous people ever. But this is it. This makes Taylor Swift look like us. It's, it's like <laughs> in, in, it, it's just a little nothing compared to Taylor Swift, and then she is nothing compared to them back in those days if you were to compare the two. This was the biggest thing that has ever happened. Somebody walked on another planet. So I think what we're seeing is the behavior of people just recalling what happened and getting it across as as tightly and succinctly as they do when they're at work, when they're saying, what's the problem up there? What's going on? And they say this, 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 and this. Here's how this looks, this looks, and this looks. And I think that's the way they're relaying their their information. And I think that's why it looks a little bit off, a little bit off-putting, a little bit um, out of the norm, because it is out of the norm. Anything at this point would be out of the norm for anybody. Are you saying that everything looks as it should? I, that's, I was going to say that. I'm it's glad not you not did. Planet, didn't you say that. Scott. It's not a planet, <laughs> Scott. If you want to say that, just say that. <laughs> yeah, I, I said that on, on the news the other night, on the uh, that was good. Uh, was it how, did, how did they take it? It, it just went right just by. Went over their heads. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. So, well, man, I thought of you, Chase. A number of, of experts had, prior to the flight, predicted that a good bit of difficulty might be encountered by people attempting to work on this. This didn't prove to be the case, and uh, after landing, we felt very comfortable in the lunar gravity. Uh, it, it was, in fact, in, in our view, preferable both to weightlessness and the Earth's gravity. This led us to 
believe this in conjunction with the fact that all the systems in the limb were, were operating magnificently and we had very few problems to uh, go ahead with the with the surface work immediately uh, we predicted that we might be ready uh, to leave the land by eight o'clock but those of you who followed on the ground recognize we missed our estimate by a good deal. This was due to a number of factors. Uh, one, we had uh, house cleaning to perform, uh, food packages, flight plans, and uh, all the items that we had used in the previous descent to be stowed out of the way and prior to depressurizing the, the lunar module. Uh, it took longer to depressurize the lunar module than we had anticipated, and it also took longer to get the cooling units in our backpacks uh, operating than, than we had expected. In sum and substance, it took us approximately an hour longer to get ready than, 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 we, would, than, than we had predicted. When, uh, when we actually descended the, the ladder, it, found, it was found to be very much like the lunar gravity simulations we had performed here on Earth. And no difficulty was, was encountered in, in descending the ladder. The last step was about three and a half feet from the surface. Uh, and uh, we're somewhat concerned that uh, we might have difficulty in, in re-entering the limb at the end of our activity period, so we practiced, uh, practiced that before doing uh, the exercise of bringing the camera down, which took the subsequent surface pictures. Here you see the camera being lowered on what might be called a Brooklyn clothesline. I, I was operating quite carefully here because immediately to my right and off the picture was a six foot deep crater and I uh, was so much concerned about uh, uh, losing my balance on the steep slopes. The, uh, the other uh, item of interest in the very early stages of EVA should it, should it have been cut short for some unknown reason was uh, the, the job of bringing back a sample of the lunar rocks and the, these photographs show the collection of that initial sample into a small bag and uh, then that bag being deposited in my uh, pocket. This was the first of a number of times when we found, found two men were a great help. I quickly put up the TV camera. <laughs> Mark, what do you get? Yeah, look, so so we've got, uh, I believe we, we have Armstrong mainly talking here. Is that correct? And yeah. and as, as, as everybody said, this is the most social of all of them. And, 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 and he doesn't seem that, you know, communicatively adept, but he's the most adept. This is somebody who, as I understand it, at university, wrote a couple of musicals and directed them. So, so this is the fun guy to be around. Like this is the this is the fun guy to be around. This is the guy who's joined the Glee Club and 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 look how stilted and staid he is. Why? Because at the same time, this is really somebody giving a, a viva voce of of the the experiment that they did. They're talking live about here's the process that we went through. This is classic pilot, engineer, analyst. And so he is as unadept at communication as any scientist I've ever seen who doesn't rise to the level of, you know, doing it on TV and being a TV personal personality around it. They're not great. I'm sorry, but they're not great communicators. That's why they often get help from people like us, because they can't, you know, they're not great at it. He's not great at it, but he's he is, Scott, as he should be for for this kind of situation and constantly 
has multiple occupations going on, all of them to an extent, constantly multiple occupations, which again is very usual for somebody with their mindset, even potentially some of their neurotypes that are there. Uh, Greg, what do you got on this one? Yeah, interestingly, um, Buzz Aldrin said he was not the kind of guy to slap on the back and be good chums with, but he was a friend. I mean, that should tell you something right there. He's not a warm, not that kind of guy. I know he's an Eagle Scout. He did a lot of stuff. He's, oddly enough, a civilian at this point, hmm. the only one of the three who was a civilian. He was a civilian astronaut. He had left the Navy. I think he went in to Purdue after being a fighter pilot in, in um, Korea and, and then came back, was in college, and then went into this whole test pilot program as a civilian. You'll hear them refer to him as Mr. Armstrong later. And so it's kind of an odd mix of people. you got a Navy guy. I think it's a Navy guy, an Air Force guy, and a civilian. So interesting. But when we talk about test pilots specifically, we talk about people who are going to come back after they do something and tell you how things worked. Well, how do they do that? Usually in writing. They may do it in a, in a recorder. But they're going to say things like, it was found to be. That may be a speech pattern for them. We say passive voice usually indicates, I want to jump on something. That's a red flag. A red flag is not, and we say this all the time, a single indicator of deception. It just means the person has a pattern. And if we keep hearing him speak that way, it probably has to do with how he's reported out. He's keenly aware of the audience. He pauses for laughter. He knows it. Now, meanwhile, there's also what we can't see here, apparently a video or imagery going off on the screen to the left. And you see him kind of be coy and make eye contact and start to laugh as the imagery is playing and even adapts a little bit. And then he fills in very quickly. Uh, we set up the, the TV camera and he smiles in amusement because they're seeing all of this piece. So good connection with the audience. I think he later became a professor of aeronautics at, I think, uh, University of Cincinnati or one of those schools. So he clearly is good at connecting with people, but not necessarily the most warm, exciting guy in the bit. We get Aldrin for that. And the reason I said, Chase, he would punch you is when he was in his 70s, he punched a, a moon landing denier. So <laughs> maybe he's still got it in it. You better watch it this time. <laughs> uh, Scott, what do you got? Yeah, he's 98 now. Buzz Aldrin. See that 98 years old. And, and I mean, can you imagine that? 98 years old. Oof, that's old. Anyway, so I, I agree with you. I think these are all, they're, these are just overview of details that are being broken down so normal civilians, normal people can understand it, what what happened. And like you were saying, Mark, this is these are guys that go through these really technical things, but they're trying not to be technical as they explain what's happening. And so it it's kind of tough for them, I think. And I think you're right. I think Neil Armstrong at this point is like the they're like, he's going crazy, man. Look at him up there. <laughs> You know, because he's he's one that moves and talks the most, and it has the most movement up there. Uh, but his 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 cadence gets a little bit jerky, and his his limited eye contact with the audience that tells us that that these are these are all cues for someone who's who's lacking confidence in talking to a whole bunch of people because he's never really done that before. I think he probably got into teaching after this because he found he didn't maybe he got used to it. After talking to the world, shoot, talking to 200 people a day or 300, 500 people a day, that's nothing. Remember when we first started doing uh, get your first speaking gigs, how odd it was. You'd stand up there and, and this is body language. And, and you did something like the 738.55 rule. <laughs> but everybody was like, yeah, that's true. So, we, yeah, yeah. Oof. Uh, so that that's where he started with this. He's basically back there. This is one of his first big speaking gigs, you know, the, fir the first five of them anyway. So he he's 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 lacking the confidence he should have should have there. And I think that's what we're seeing. And trying to be funny, I think he does a good job of it for for who he is and what he's doing. You don't have a whole lot to work with there. But uh, on Chase, you're going to try and refute anything we've said at all. Well, what you got. You're all full of it. <laughs> your I'm face kidding. is full of it. What did you say to Greg? Your face is <laughs> what? Take care your of face is irrelevant. <laughs> full of it. Your face is irrelevant. I, I, I think I'm going to call Mr. Aldrin on you. Yeah. So I think uh, Bayview here is a lot more similar to his baseline. Nervousness starts to dissipate when the crowd starts laughing, and there's a look of uh, almost resignation that I was completely unable to find any previous uh, video of them uh, where he does this again. 
And there's a sharp contrast in their behavior of rigidity uh, that was never there before that might indicate some sort of defiance. I keep seeing all these behaviors of defiance. We're going to get into that more and maybe how that uh, might be defiance and and also not deception at the same time. But it's also some kind of a resignation that shows in the lack of enthusiasm that we definitely 100 percent saw in the pre-mission briefing when they did this uh, press conference. They had enthusiasm. There's also a lack of eye contact compared to the the pre-mission press conference and this feeling of a lack of engagement or withdrawal that you might even just feel watching some of this. So it's kind of a withdrawal from from what's going on. Not that that's deception, but it's definitely interesting, and it might compound on what we're about to see. Let's look at the next one. Um, you can, you're convincing me, Chase. I might be coming I, out I, of your side. I think it's a <laughs> Chase. I think it's adrenal fatigue. See this pencil? How it lines up with the horizon perfectly? Yes. 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 Not curving. Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you are. You're convincing me. <laughs> no, I'm confused. I'm, I'm, my worldview is changing. I'm, I'm, I'm not confused anymore. <laughs> I'm in. You're flat earther now. <sighs> I can't. Even, I can't even say that as a Listen, joke. Proof is proof. When uh, when we actually descended the, the ladder, it found it was found to be very much like the lunar gravity simulations we had performed here on earth and no difficulty was was encountered in in descending the ladder the last step was about three and a half feet from the surface uh, and uh, we're somewhat concerned that uh, we might have difficulty in in re-entering the limb at the end of our activity period so we practiced uh, practice that before doing uh, the exercise of bringing the camera down which took the subsequent surface pictures here you see the camera being lowered on what might be called a Brooklyn clothesline I, I was operating quite carefully here because immediately to my right and off the picture was a six foot deep crater and I uh, was so much concerned about uh, uh, losing my balance on the steep slopes. The, uh, the other uh, item of interest in the very early stages of EVA, should it, should it have been cut short for some unknown reason, was uh, the, the job of bringing back a sample of the lunar rocks. And the, these photographs show the collection of that initial sample into a small bag and uh, then that bag being deposited in my uh, pocket. This was the first of a number of times when we found, found two men were a great help. I quickly put up the TV camera. But Buzz and I joined together to uh, erect the American flag. We found uh, on a number of occasions that we were help, able to help each other in many ways on the surface. Uh, you probably recall the times that I got my foot caught in the television cable and Buzz was able to help me extract it without, without falling down. We had uh, some difficulty at first uh, getting the uh, pole of the flag to remain into the surface. Uh, in penetrating the surface, we found that uh, most objects would uh, go down about five, maybe six inches, and then it would meet with a uh, gradual resistance. Uh, at the same time, there was not much of a supporting force on either side, so we had to lean the flag back slightly uh, in order for it to, uh, to maintain this position. So many people have done so much 
to give us this opportunity to place this American flag on the surface, to me it was one of the prouder moments of my life to be able to stand there and quickly salute the flag. The rest, the rest of the activity seemed to go very rushed. Uh, there were a lot of things to do, and uh, we had a hard time getting them finished. Uh, Chase, what do you got? There is some discomfort that was not present in the pre-mission press conference. One behavior that is the most common that you see in Neil is his classic forehead movement with these eyebrows coming up, eyebrows going up to accentuate his points, his eyebrows go up. This is seen in this type of person very often that's uh, socially driven. They want to communicate their point. His eyebrows will raise to communicate just about any points that he's making. And this is wholly absent here. So let's dig into this so you fully understand why I think this might be significant for you. Since I'm uh, playing this role, uh, eyebrows are very powerful tools in nonverbal communication. Greg calls it the emotional billboard, uh, I think, uh, pretty often. Yeah. And shifts in this can reveal a lot about somebody's emotional state. So using eyebrows to accentuate points suggests that somebody's highly engaged, they're expressive, they're striving to make sure that their messages are clear and impactful. And this kind of animated eyebrow movement very often indicates enthusiasm and a desire to connect with the listener or the audience. But the shift to minimal movement and his eyebrows predominantly moving downward in this whole video uh, this change could suggest a, a, a few things. First, that the downward movement of the eyebrows, uh, we typically associate that with negative emotions like anger, frustration. Frustration is interesting here, and it might indicate some internal conflict or negative feelings. We're seeing a wholly different expression on a person's face than they've done before. So this shift in eyebrow movement in anybody that you ever observe in your own life could also suggest a defensive or a, a guarded state. And I will say this might not necessarily be defiance, but it could be a form of some kind of emotional withdrawal, like he's put up some kind of a barrier and reducing his level of vulnerability to the people. And we talk a lot about context. And in this context, we know so little about what went on behind the scenes. So Neil passes it to Buzz and has to make that attempt at kind of touching his arm. Mark's going to really dig into this. I, I guarantee you. Uh, but compared to the previous video, the pre-mission conference, the language, which is the syntax, is what I'm referring to. Just the words and the rhythm uh, seem to be a lot more scripted and forced. This does look way more scripted if you contrast it between that pre-mission uh, press conference. It looks more scripted. Not that it's deceptive, Maybe not yet, but it's definitely scripted. Mark, what do you got? Uh, yeah, so I would agree. This is scripted, and I think we see that because it's Buzz's bit, and Buzz has forgotten, I think, that it's his bit. And so uh, Armstrong has to lean over and give him, you know, somewhat of a nudge or a touch or get close to remind him, look, I did my bit. It's it's your bit now. Now, so, so, you know, what is the stress involved here that means people are forgetting when their bit is or zoning out in some way? As I say, Chase, I haven't seen these other interviews. Here's what I would make somewhat of a gamble on, and, and I, could, I could lose money on this, but I would make a gamble that the other interviews, the lights weren't all down in order to show this footage. The lights have gone out. I mean, they've gone out on the audience as well because those early projectors, they wouldn't be bright enough to be able to show everything. You've got to turn the whole of the lights out. That means where then they're up on that stage, that means they can't see the audience at all, which would mean somebody who's looking for those cues, looking for that audience to be able to do the eyebrow raise and go, hey, you know, it's hearing my story. They've got no eyes looking back at them, so they might start going for more of a flat effect because their, their brain is going, where are all the people for me to perform to? Which is m why it might get, be getting more socially stilted. And when we see him get a result out of the audience, that laughter, because the lights being out doesn't stop the audience, you hearing the audience. 
then we see him brighten up because like, ah, the audience is out there. I'm getting the effect that I'm looking for. So look, I could be proved wrong on this. And, you know, go and look at those other videos and write down below, hey, Mark, you got it completely wrong. The lights were all, all out and put your reasons why you think they were so different in these different interviews. But for me, that might solve that case. Now, uh, Buzz Aldrin here, what I like about him, he's talking about putting in the American flag, obviously a massively important moment there as he puts forward, but he mimes it with his pen and he's spot on with the baton gesture there, spot on. This happened just from seeing him mime that and being right on with the baton gestures, my analysis goes, well, that moment happened. So if this happened in a TV studio somewhere, they built the right amount of earth. They built it exactly right because he's telling the truth as to how that flag went in. And it was slightly problematic. And I would go, if you were going to fake this one, you wouldn't create problems. You'd make it so it works. You'd stick a little hole in there. You'd go, look, the mark is there. We've put a little golf hole in there. It's going to fit beautifully. It's going to be a great moment. It's going to be <laughs> going to be fantastic, okay? He doesn't tell what would be the dramatic story of like, and I went over there and I put it in the ground and it went straight in there, solid as a rock. No, he's like, it was actually quite tricky getting it in there. It's it's a bit of a problem. But all of that story is there. Seems absolutely honest and truthful to me. Um, Scott, what do you got on this one? Okay, I'm with you on that. So I'll move on to, to Buzz's. I'll call him Buzz, like I know him. Uh, his behavior during that, because what you just described is the same thing Buzz Aldrin does when he talks about walking through uh, how the landscape changes and those things. And every time he starts to, to to describe what happened, he starts going through it and illustrating what happened there. What do you call it, Chase? Uh, what narration? Uh, just body narration. Yeah. Body narration. So he's so he's narrating with his body what happened as he goes through that. So he's he's in a way reliving what happened, but he's wanting you to go along with him because he's like, look, man, here's what happened. We go down this, and so that's what he's saying. We went down this way, and you come across this. So he wants you to to feel like you're there too. He may not be like the the guy to be that way. Hey, everybody, this is what happened. But as he's doing that, that's what he's doing. He's going going over it in his mind as as it happened. I see nothing out of the ordinary in this situation. At all, again, just three guys who and and, and talk. About, let's talk about Collins for a second. He's sitting over there. He doesn't have a lot to say because he was just kind of driving. He drove them there, and they got out and got to do everything, and then got back in and went back up and left. You know, he drove them home. But but still, he's he's he. I think he's the most relaxed looking because he didn't have to. He didn't have to talk about anything really. Not much at all. It's not that nobody cared that he drove. <laughs> in other words, you got to have somebody drive you to the party, man. But, you know, he, he knows he's just like he was just lucky to be there. He's like the Ringo of of the uh, Apollo 11 mission, I think. Greg, what do you got? Yeah. So let's start off by talking about one thing specifically, Chase, to your point of they were more energized before. There's two different conversations. Tomorrow I'm going to strap my ass to a rocket and I'm going to the moon. You think that might jack you up a little bit. It might give you more animation, more speaking. And then when you're coming down, imagine I've just been to the moon. Now I get to go tell people about it. And I'm not a guy who likes to be in front of people necessarily. That's not what I do. So I, I equate it to if you know a guy who is really kind of an engineer type and going to tell you how things work and you say, hey, there's this lake I want to know about. Go out there, take your boat out and come back and tell me how it looks. He comes back and tells you the water's about 62 degrees. It's just not exciting because they don't care about the same things you care. When you go out on a lake, you're going to look for different things. So I think part of what we're seeing is that style of communication. There's also the whole part that... There's a screen showing. We can't tell what's there. Mark, I agree with you 100% about the dark, because the, if you're old enough to remember watching movies in class, I'd be asleep by about three minutes <laughs> and you're watching some stupid movie that didn't work right because you had to have a projector and you could not see other people in the room. And that's probably part of it as well. I think that human need and you're, you hit it dead on Chase with that. I agree with 100% that need to connect is that forehead. And if he needs to connect, he's not getting the feedback. Well, that's an awkward feeling. And then let's add to it what's going on in the video. Here's one of the most adept people in America, physically adept, chosen because he's 
probably has cat like reflexes and he's been a test pilot and he gets his foot hung in a cable the first time a human walks on the moon. You think that might cause him a little bit of distress when people are watching it and giggling, even if he knows who he is and he's comfortable. That's one of the things I would think is affecting his behavior and him looking for approval when he does those kinds of things. Um, I also think there's a little bit of embarrassment when he says things went a little faster than had to go a little faster than they should, because I think they played around more than they should. Later in a video, he actually says, if I were changing anything, I would give people a little bit of time to get familiar so they look comfortable. But I'm with you as well, Mark, that driving that stake in and all of the all of the illustration or chases, you call it body narration is a great way to call it. Everything they're saying, you see their words moving. Some of them are more demonstrative. Buzz Aldrin is more demonstrative than Armstrong, but that's just part of it. And then when we look at, I said earlier, Collins looks like kind of the third guy to date because he's sitting there waiting for his chance to talk and he does get it. But what is he going to say? He's just got to sit there and look happy about what happened and was a key part of it. That's one of the best things about this thing is when they ask him, he said, no, I didn't feel like a third wheel at all. I felt like they needed me to get home. That's a good way to look at it. So, but they're only wanting to talk about the moon at the point. That's all I got. I can go with Mark. Yeah, He's yeah, very well, confident. Very just confident. Exp in my desk. Expert. And, and then more leisurely, but... Buzz and I joined together to uh, erect the American flag. We found uh, on a number of occasions that we were able to help each other in many ways on the surface. Uh, you probably recall the times that I got my foot caught in the television cable and Buzz was able to help me extract it without, without falling down. We had uh, some difficulty at first uh, getting the uh, pole of the flag to remain into the surface. Uh, in penetrating the surface, we found that uh, most objects would uh, go down about five, maybe six inches, and then it would meet with a uh, gradual resistance. Uh, at the same time, there was not much of a supporting force on either side, so we had to lean the flag back slightly uh, in order for it to, uh, to maintain this position. So many people have done so much to give us this opportunity to place this American flag on the surface. To me, it was one of the prouder moments of my life to be able to stand there and quickly salute the flag. The rest, the rest of the activity seemed to go very rushed. Uh, there were a lot of things to do, and uh, we had a hard time getting them finished. Two experiments uh, that you saw in a previous picture uh, were deployed in the scientific equipment bay. Uh, we found that uh, getting them down uh, produced no significant problems. And uh, here you see uh, a view of my carrying these two experiments out to the deployment site about 70 feet to the uh, south of the lunar module. You have a very good view of the uh, varying depths of this uh, upper surface layer. You see that uh, along the crater rim, uh, a small crater rim off to my left, uh, along this the, uh, the upper surface appears to be about uh, two to three inches and the subsurface uh, uh, has a slope that is rather ill-defined and uh, one has to be very careful in, in threading your way around these very uh, small craters. Any long excursions I feel would would take a good bit of attention as you're uh, moving along to avoid uh, walking along uh, or down the slope of some of these smaller craters. This is the uh, passive uh, seismic uh, experiment that was deployed and has been giving us uh, good returns on the uh, uh, interactions of the, uh, of the moon. Uh, we had a uh, little difficulty deploying one of the panels. Uh, I had to move around to the far side and, and uh, release a restraining lever, and uh, then the second panel came out. 
We had a little bit of difficulty determining, as Neil said, uh, the exact uh, local horizontal. And I think this is due to the uh, decrease in the cues that a person has as to which way uh, up, up really is. One has to lean a little bit more off to the side before you get this body cue that, that uh, you're approaching uh, off balance. And of course, the, the terrain varied considerably uh, in this area. Uh, this second experiment is the uh, uh, laser reflector. We've uh, been successful in uh, bouncing laser beams off this. It consists of a hundred uh, arrays of uh, corner reflectors. The uh, other experiment, uh, please. All right, Greg, what do you got? So here's more proof that this word pattern and language is typical of this type of person. Think about a, a test pilot and when they come back. We think today most times people would do something through a voice recorder, probably not as much in these guys' era because they're like post, post war guys. They're in the 40s and 50s doing this flying. So they probably had to come back and write out a report. That same language they would say, as I approached the speed of sound, I started to notice a rumbling in the right wing. That rumbling continued through the, you can hear where that would go. And that's the way they're talking because they're telling you a story. And they may, to your point, Mark, it may even be written down on that paper and they're talking about the things so they don't forget key points that were important. He says another word, he uses a passive word, my carrying things. His hands, again, are illustrating what his mouth is saying. So it's congruent messaging between body and the other. His hands are moving to illustrate varying depths of the surface layer. There's this passive seismic passive, passive seismic sensors and reflectors. And if, if you are a person who believes, and I'm, I'm going to make somebody irate for sure, Chase, you might be one of them. If you're a person who believes we didn't go to the moon, explain those reflectors that you tonight can find with a laser and get a reflection if you have the right equipment <clears> that have been there since 1969. They put more in too. And if the other one is my favorite, is if you ever see this latest probe that flies around the moon, it looks like you can tell humans have been there because there's junk there. There's stuff, there's tracks in the dirt, and there's you know a dune buggy and some other stuff there. So Chase, what do you got to that, to that one? Yep, I agree. Uh, but this really? this looks a lot more natural, except for one thing, which I'll detail in a second. But Buzz takes the reins here, and he's speaking only slightly less enthusiastic than before and slightly more reserved uh, than his baseline. He's comfortable with narrating that story with his hands so well, and everything looks as it should. The only thing here... As far as the group's behavior that I thought might be noteworthy uh, was that these guys look at each other like all the time when they're speaking in the initial pre-mission conference all the time. There's none of that here, but that could be because of the display up on the wall for everybody to look at. That's maybe a big one that they're kind of diverting a lot of attention to that. That's the only thing I noticed in this clip. Scott, what do you got? Yeah, Chase, your face is irrational. There are a lot of <laughs> adapting with the hands here, and that's be, that, and that's normal because again, they're, the, they're everybody's everybody's watching this. So, and like Greg, you were saying, you guys pretty much knocked out everything I was going to say because he's being precise with his words. He's actually, it, it's very congruent. Everything that's happening with his words and with his hands. His he, uh, Armstrong's adapting, and then they've got Buzz talking with his hands. I mean, everything. <laughs> Everything looks normal to me, you know. the The words are important to him. Him getting these these points across. So we're looking at, at guys who are into to detail at its highest level, trying to dumb things down so they can talk normally. You know, it's like talking to an astrophysicist in their language. You know, that's tough. They're they're going to be talking about stuff we have no idea what they're talking about. So, I, I that that's what I think is happening here. Mark, what do you got? Uh, yeah, look, if, if I faked a moon landing, what I'd be trying to do right now is really sell it to the audience, like really sell it. And I'd be selling, if I was in charge of communication on this, on propaganda on this, what I'd be doing is you need to go in and we need stories of like awe and impact. We've got to get emotional on this because we need to distract people away from those images because they will find something wrong with that because it's faked. And so we're going to have awe, we're going to have impact, we're going to have emotion. What do we get from these guys? Like the dullest stuff ever. It's all uh, topography, geography, 
operational stuff, procedural stuff. It's like there's nothing interesting happening at all. And th- and they're trying to do it in our language as well. They're not using any of the acronyms or they're trying to make it palatable for, for a general audience. And it's tedious. If you were creating propaganda, you wouldn't go down this route. You'd be like, you know, I I, I I got down there and the sun rose and I was just in absolute awe. I couldn't move at that point in it. And it, and it, it shocked me to my soul. Edward yeah. Bernays would have been involved in this. Sorry, say that again. Edward Bernays would have been involved with this. Absolutely. Absolutely. If only to be making this, the, the sauce for the steak. Yeah, um, you, you know, it's like, you're gonna slam that jar of moon dust down. So <laughs> you get to zoom in on it. Right, exactly, the- exactly. You'd be pouring the moon dust out and going and blowing it over the audience, and like you know, be, you could do moon. so much here, but they don't do any of this stuff. And here's the thing as well: is they're focused on the imagery over there. If this were faked, if this were a lie, I'd expect them to be looking away from it to be oh, to be. Yeah. Um, to be uh, eye blocking from it, they wouldn't be able to avoid that. If you know you've created a fake and you're trying to convince an audience with it, you're going to want to distract from it, and you're not going to want to see it. We see no disgust from anybody. We see no contempt from anybody. No, while they're looking at that thing, yeah, I mean they're they're all looking at it and they all seem yeah. fine with it. You know, so obviously they're super well. They're either super well trained. Um, Maybe they're actors, Mark. Yeah, they're great they're actors. actors. <laughs> the great actors, but the people who trained them how to act at no point went in and be really emotional. They didn't complete what you should do. Um, so it looks, looks completely real to me. Two experiments uh, that you saw in a previous picture uh, were deployed in a scientific equipment bay. Uh, we found that uh, getting them down uh, produced no significant problems. And... Uh, and here you see uh, a view of my carrying these two experiments out to the deployment site about 70 feet to the uh, south of the lunar module. You have a very good view of the uh, varying depths of this uh, upper surface layer. You see that uh, along the crater rim, uh, a small crater rim off to my left, uh, along this the, uh, the upper surface appears to be about uh, two to three inches. And the subsurface uh, uh, has a slope that is rather ill-defined, and uh, one has to be very careful in, in threading your way around these very uh, small craters. Any long excursions, I feel, would, would take a good bit of attention as you're uh, moving along to avoid uh, walking along uh, or down the slope of some of these smaller craters. This is the uh, passive uh, seismic uh, experiment that was deployed and has been giving us uh, good returns on the uh, uh, interactions of the uh, of the moon. Uh, we had a uh, little difficulty deploying one of the panels. Uh, I had to move around to the far side and, and uh, release a restraining lever, and uh, then the second panel came out. We had a little bit of difficulty determining, as Neil said, uh, the exact uh, local horizontal. And I think this is due to the uh, decrease in the cues that a person has as to which way uh, up, up really is. One has to lean a little bit more off to the side before you get this body cue that, that uh, you're approaching uh, off balance. And of course, the, the terrain varied considerably uh, in this area. Uh, this second experiment is the uh, uh, laser reflector. We've uh, been successful in uh, bouncing laser beams off this. It consists of a hundred uh, arrays of uh, corner reflectors. The uh, other experiment, uh, please. We're ready now for question and answers and wait for the microphone and we'll go right down the line and we'll catch everyone if you'll just be patient. How much time did you have left in your uh, life support backpacks uh, at the time you got back on board LAM? 
Uh, I haven't seen the post-flight analysis of the numbers. Uh, we had rough, uh, roughly half of our available oxygen supply remaining in the backpacks and uh, somewhat less uh, percentage uh, in the water supplies, which is used for cooling. Uh, of course, uh, particularly on our first experience with the use of that backpack on the lunar surface, we were interesting, interested in conserving a good bit of margin in case we had difficulty with closing the hatch or repressurizing the limb or had any difficulties with getting uh, the uh, systems operating again in the normal fashion inside the cockpit. Uh, Colonel Aldrin and Mr. Armstrong. Uh, Mark, what do you got? Uh, yeah, so on this one here, uh, no change in behavior, as as I can see it. Chase, maybe you've got some there, because maybe I'm biased, you know? So maybe there'll be a change in behavior, but I can't see it. They're not selling any of this drama. They're not creating any drama to sell. Like, it's just procedural stuff going on here. And, and the only, actually, the only change in baseline for me, Chase, and you might be interested in this, is he does a misspeak of, um, he says, interesting, and he should have said interested. And at that point, he does an eyebrow raise on there. Um, I think that's an eyebrow raise of concern because he got a word wrong. So this is, I mean, I get so, you know, in this show, I must get so many, so many words. I mean, I just did it then. So many words wrong. And I don't really worry about it because, look, you know, I'm going to be talking to audiences every day again and again and again. What am I going to do? He's super concerned about getting one word wrong. Now, if this was a guy who was making up a story about this. There would be so many, you wouldn't be concerned, do I get a word wrong? You'd be like, can I get this story out, which is absolutely falsified and inaccurate? Can I just do that? Can I just get to the end? This is a guy who gets concerned about one word. Uh, but Chase, wh what do you say? Do you see any other changes there? Uh, yeah, let's talk about it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Not a but uh, let's talk about the difference between fidgeting and adapting, just as an educational point here. Fidgeting is about burning off excess energy in your body. You've got some adrenaline that spikes up because you're scared. Your body produces adrenaline or epinephrine, uh, and you, you need to burn that off. Your body says, hey, man, you need to burn this off. So you see people tapping their leg and doing stuff to burn off energy. Then we have adapting. Adapting is about feeling a lack of control. So we tend to engage in unnecessary adjustments to our surroundings as a way to increase the feeling of control because the feeling of control is lacking. So this behavior of the adapting is usually rooted in, in a psychological need to exert some kind of influence over our surroundings, which in turn reduces feelings of anxiety. So it brings us and maybe I have some control here again. So as an example, somebody might repeatedly align their stuff on a desk all the time, adjusting the position of their chair multiple times, continuously checking and then rechecking items that they're carrying. And they might seem pretty trivial, but they can really provide us with a sense of mastery when we do them or dominance over the area around us. Trump, President Trump does this a lot. Uh, it can also be a nonverbal cue that somebody's trying to prepare mentally for a task or trying to create a physical environment that mirrors the order or structure that they desire mentally. So think about that. Buzz Aldrin is doing this a ton in this clip. Why he's doing it specifically, we can't say. We're not mind readers. But we do know it's almost always because of a feeling of having little to no control or, or dominion over a situation which I thought was interesting that there was a lack of control. Maybe it's the script. Maybe they were told to stick to a script. Greg, what do you got? One of the things that I always call what you're just describing, when you're talking about adapting with people, is it is a way to make the unfamiliar familiar. Because if I always do this, that's com that's going to be comforting and relaxing and take control of my environment. And if you ever really want to see it, when you put people in a cage – they do it immediately because what they're doing is taking some control of their environment without any conscious thought. It just makes them comfortable because they're doing it over and over and over. So all the stuff you just said wraps up in that. Yeah, I agree with you 100 percent. That It doesn't mean a person's being deceptive. It means they're taking control of their environment in some way to make the unfamiliar familiar. The other piece I would say is there's one beautiful piece of body language in here. 
when he gets this real concern in his brow, Mark, I'm not talking about when he does the word wrong, but when he gets a real concern in his brow, he's talking about the, them having to keep reserve capacity in case, in case the airlock didn't work. And you can see that probably is residual emotion. That's We always say when a person's telling a story, that's the most animated thing we see out of this guy the entire time. But he does a little brow crunch and almost a grief muscle there when he's thinking about what would have happened if the door would have stuck. That's all that is. But it's a beautiful example of residual emotion, and you get the chance to see it in somebody who is not that demonstrative. Scott, what do you got? All right. I agree with you, Mark. This isn't an answer you'd make up. Why would, be, why would you want to make up something for, for an answer like this? It's well delivered, delivered smoothly, and it's an easy non-tech answer, you know? So I think it's just, and that's why his cadence speeds up a little bit, because he's confident giving it. So it just kind of comes right out. That's the only really big change we're seeing in him is there because this is the most confidence he has the whole time, I think. You guys got everything else, so I'll move on. Okay, Chase, because of the squint. Give oh, me that because of the squint. Nice. That was nice. <laughs> that, was, that was tight, man. I tried to push a, a pen up my nose for variety, but it didn't even trump the squint. It's like... <laughs> We're ready now for question and answers and wait for the microphone and we'll go right down the line. We'll catch everyone if you'll just be patient. Tom, we'll see. How much time did you have left in your uh, life support backpacks uh, at the time you got back on board LAM? Uh, I haven't seen the post-flight analysis of the numbers. Uh, we had rough, uh, roughly half of our available oxygen supply remaining in the backpacks and uh, somewhat less uh, percentage uh, in the water supplies, which is used for cooling. Uh, of course, uh, particularly on our first experience with the use of that backpack on the lunar surface, we were interesting, interested in conserving a good bit of margin in case we had difficulty with closing the hatch or repressurizing the limb or had any difficulties with getting uh, the uh, systems operating again in the normal fashion inside the cockpit. Uh, Colonel Aldrin and Mr. Armstrong. Uh, Colonel Aldrin and Mr. Armstrong. Uh, when President Nixon made his phone call to you on the moon, it looked like you, the two of you suddenly stopped doing, doing everything and stood there and listened and talked to him. It looked there for a moment like you might have been a little bit aware of what was going on. You weren't busy. Was there ever a moment on the moon when either one of you were just a little bit spellbound by what was going on? About two and a half hours. <laughs> I'd like to ask Neil Armstrong when he began to think of what he would say when he put his foot down on the lunar surface and how long he pondered this, this state, the statement about uh, a small step for man, gigantic leap for mankind. Yes, I did uh, think about it. Uh, it I, it was not extemporaneous, neither was it planned. It evolved during the conduct of the flight, and I decided what the words would be while we were on the lunar, lunar surface just prior to leaving the land. I'd like to ask Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin, and I'm not quite sure how to ask this question, but when you first stepped on the moon, did it strike you as you were stepping, that you were stepping on uh, a piece of the earth, or uh, uh, sort of what your inner feelings were, uh, uh, whether you felt you were standing in a desert, or this was really another world, or how you felt at that point? Well, there was no question in our minds where we were. We've been orbiting around the moon. <laughs> At the same time, uh, uh, we have experienced uh, 1.6G before. Uh, we've been exposed to some degree to the, uh, the lighting that we saw. Uh, however, this was, in my case, an extremely foreign situation with the uh, stark nature of the uh, light and dark conditions. And of course, we uh, first set foot on the moon in, in the dark shadowy area. All right, Greg, your face is irrational. Okay, sounds good. 
<laughs> so it, there's only one thing in here that's really, really interesting to me, and is there's a baseline change in Buzz in Aldrin when they talk about Colonel and Mister. He does a different thing. He kind of closes his hands, moves his hands to a new position. And it made me wonder, and so I went to look and see if there was any kind of rub between them about that civilian versus a colonel thing. Didn't find anything. Nobody said anything. But he surely looked kind of uncomfortable there when they said that. More than we've seen anything else here. But both of them are relieved to be able to say that what he said. When he said for about two and a half hours, you see their mm -hmm. faces just light up, really genuine smiles, all the eye involvement and all of that. I don't think Armstrong, I can't imagine him ever being a really comfortable public speaker just because he doesn't look like it. And we're back to Collins is looking like a friend on a date here. He smiles and does whatever he needs to do, grips his hands and adapts to be comfortable. I, my favorite line of the whole thing is when Aldrin is so sarcastic about, did you not know where you were? Well, we had a pretty good idea. We've been circling the moon a few times. <laughs> and in this one, I notice something very interesting. If you listen to the speech pattern of Buzz Aldrin and you go listen to the speech patterns of Eisenhower, they're almost identical. It's interesting to hear that bump, 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 bump. But there's no surprise. He's a West Point educated guy, right, post-war. So you would expect he's going to hear these same people. You're going to hear those same speech patterns from those military folks. Chase and I sound like the people who were our, our whatever they were called. They were called, you, you call them drills or what do you call them in boot camp? RDC for the Navy. Yeah, so we call them drill search, whatever they are. You pick up their speech patterns. You pick up senior speech, speech patterns you go. So you're going to pick those up. Not surprising. It's just an interesting way to look at it. Uh, Chase, what do you got? More adapting from Neil and Buzz here. Other than that, everything else looks Good. as it should. <laughs> uh, Here's here's just one unusual thing here. I did think it was unusual how Buzz interpreted the question. An innocuous question about how everything felt was interpreted almost like he took it personally as someone questioning their physical location. I thought that was interesting. Scott, what do you got? Yeah, again, I don't think this, this is an answer that would be made up. When you look at his face when he's answering that question, Man, he's reliving being on the moon, how happy he was to be there. He could not, There, that looks like a little kid on Christmas Day when you bring him, when they get whatever it is they want. You know, that thing they've talked about forever, and they get it. That's what his face, all of them did, but especially Neil Armstrong. Man, he was into it, leaned into it. So I think, I think, uh, I, 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 I just don't see, I, I'm not seeing anything out of place here at all, especially in something like this. Mark, what about you? Yeah, so what's interesting for me is there's two moments of making a joke, you know, doing some some comedy there, and I'll come to why that's important in a moment. But the the second one is this uh, literal interpretation that Buzz Aldrin makes. Now that is very, uh, you know, that's there are neurotypes that will make these literal translations a lot, and sometimes very funny with that. But they they're just being very literal you know, around the situation. Maybe there's some of that uh, in there. So, you know, he's 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 not in the world of, he's first of all in the world of things, and then he's in the world of the, the metaphorical expression of a feeling or an emotion. And there's that moment of comedy be, from going from one to the other, and which one is he in? Well, the whole audience laughs with him. As they do on everybody reacts to the joke of two and a half hours everybody in the room. Now, in order for everybody to react, everybody has to be engaged with the same story. They have to be listening to the same story and they have to have the same level of tension around that, that, that story for everybody to release it on the punchline. That is very hard to do if you're lying. It's super hard to do. Like we don't, you know, we don't do in, uh, a lot of footage of liars who are getting people to laugh at the same time. You might go, oh, well, you know, you watch a comedian, well, they're making up stories. Yes, but there's a absolute nugget of truth in there that everybody accepts and everybody understands, and they're all in the same world at the same time. That alone, to get everybody to laugh at the two and a half hours, that for me says, well, they had to have been there for two and a half hours because that whole lineup of astronauts all laugh at the same time. The whole audience, if that audience were getting a sense of them making this stuff up, they wouldn't be laughing 
right now because the tension wouldn't have built around it. So looks super honest to me. But let's let's see what we got next. Maybe something else. Greg's trying. I'll give you that one, yeah, Greg. Yeah, I leaned in. <clears throat> I'll give you that one. Uh, Colonel Aldrin and Mr. Armstrong, uh, when President Nixon made his phone call to you on the moon, it looked like you, the two of you suddenly stopped doing, doing everything and stood there and listened and talked to him. It looked there for a moment like you might have been a little bit aware of what was going on. You weren't busy. Was there ever a moment on the moon when either one of you were just a little bit spellbound by what was going on? About two and a half hours. <laughs> I'd like to ask Neil Armstrong when he began to think of what he would say when he put his foot down on the lunar surface and how long he pondered this, this sta the statement about uh, a small step for man, gigantic leap for mankind. Yes, I did uh, think about it. Uh, it, I, it was not extemporaneous, neither was it planned. It evolved during the conduct of the flight, and I decided what the words would be while we were on the lunar, lunar surface just prior to leaving the land. I'd like to ask Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin, and I'm not quite sure how to ask this question, but when you first stepped on the moon, did it strike you as you were stepping that you were stepping on uh, a piece of the earth, or uh, uh, sort of what your inner feelings were, uh, uh, whether you felt you were standing in a desert, or this was really another world, or how you felt at that point? Well, there was no question in our minds where we were. We've been orbiting around the moon for quite a while. At, at the same time, uh, uh, we have experienced uh, 1-6-G before. Uh, we've been exposed to some degree to the, uh, the lighting that we saw. Uh, however, this was, in my case, uh, an extremely foreign situation with the uh, stark nature of the uh, light and dark conditions. And of course, we uh, first set foot on the moon in, in the dark shadowy area. I'm struck uh, from the movies and the still pictures by the difference in the very hostile appearance of the moon when you're orbiting over it or some distance from it and the uh, warmer colors and the relatively, apparently relatively more friendly appearance of it when you're on the surface. I'd like to ask Colonel Collins if he gets that same impression from the pictures and uh, the two of you who were on the moon, what impression you have along those lines? Well, the moon uh, changes character as the uh, angle of sunlight striking its surface changes. At uh, very low sun angles, close to the terminator, or dawn or at dusk, it has the, uh, the harsh uh, forbidding characteristics which uh, you see in a lot of the photographs. On the other hand, when uh, the sun is m more closely uh, overhead, the midday situation, uh, the moon is uh, takes on more of a of a brown color, uh, almost a or becomes uh, almost a, a rosy looking place, a, a fairly friendly place. So that from uh, from dawn through uh, midday through dusk, you you run the, the, the whole gamut. Of it. it starts off very forbidding, becomes friendly, and uh, then becomes forbidding again as the sun. All right, Chase, what do you got? If you watch Collins in the pre-mission conference, he's comfortable, he's in control, has occasional postural bumps and minimal fidgeting. In this clip, while he's describing the moon's color and character, he's fidgeting a lot more. Uncertainty behaviors increase about 400%, maybe 100% more, give or take. But what does uncertainty behaviors look like? Shoulder shrugs hand movement that isn't in time with his words on specific words and phrases like I did just then. Single shoulder shrugs, postural adjustments, head movements not in time or in line with his words and specifically having the appearance of being performed to illustrate a point. I would not ever say that this is deception, but we have definitely seen him in front of lots of people with lots of cameras and being asked questions before. And this is a very similar situation. And this is different. There's something different here. So there's a definite deviation from baseline. 
And I think if you look at some of the stars from the 60s, especially when they went on Saturday Night Live, and they were told that they have to pretend to play instruments or pretend to sing over a track and they would eat a banana and they would do these things that were like a, a protest to having to go onto a script and not be themselves. Maybe that's what we're seeing here. That's uh, all I got for that one. Greg, what do you got? Maybe he's awkward because it's his only time to talk and he maybe don't want to screw <laughs> it up. Too, Chase. I mean, he's going to get to answer one question while the rest of these guys... This is, again, he's kind of like the third wheel. So it may be that. It may be performance anxiety. Who knows? But there's something. What's really interesting about it is you can tell this is not an engineer. He had a degree in military science. I think he retired as a two-star. But So he's an accomplished military officer, but not an engineer. He sounds different than those other guys. He's telling a story in human terms. He's talking normally. My favorite part of the whole thing is when he first gets called on, they instinctively sit back. The two guys who walk the moon sit back and give him the floor in a regulator. And then they're like, oh, OK, we better lean back forward and remember where we are. It's a beautiful thing. It makes me think of when we first started our show and we were all like uh, 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 trying to figure out who goes first and second and next and all that kind of thing. So it's, it's beautiful to watch all of that work out. And I agree with you. It's interesting to see the difference in the way he's speaking here in the time before. Uh, Scott, what do you got? You know what the cringiest thing was about some of those first episodes we did were, or was? You. My you. haircut. <laughs> my haircut. <laughs> Not just my haircut back then. <laughs> but it was when we would say, we'd go around the room and talk about what our favorite body language cue was. Remember that? Yeah. Oh, I man. I did that once or twice, and it was awful. Those are rough. That's you like somebody those. asking these guys, what's your favorite gravity? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Space one or moon rock. What's your yeah, favorite part of the Van Allen belt? Just what, just <laughs> when you went through it, what was it like? What'd you think? Oh man, it's just, that stuff's tough, tough to watch. It was crazy for me. I was, I was inside my kitchen pretending like it was an office. Yeah. And I felt, I felt so inauthentic that whole time. Yeah, but then you moved up, man. Remember, you used to have all your books the same color and all that. And everybody was like, good. Chase, your good. books are all the same color. Yeah. Remember that? Yeah. Yeah, man. I learned that on Pinterest. Yeah, it worked. It worked. Um, all right. Well, anyway, so Collins is describing that this is excellent because it, a lot of what he's describing are the changes in color on the on the topography of the moon as the sun changes, as, as the angle of the moon and the sun uh, change. And that's one of the big arguments about whether this was fake, faked or not, because some pictures have, you know, the the uh, the brown uh, moon dirt or soil or whatever. And then others, it's gray. And he he explains that right here. He explains a couple of things in here. We'll get to the second one in a minute. And I think that's really important because all these people are saying all these things about the moon landing being faked. Pretty much everything they're refuting, except for the camera angles of the shadows, which you, which a lot of you can actually do out in your driveway when the sun's out. And no kidding, you really can't, um, is this. This is one of them. This is one of those times that he explains exactly what's happening. And I don't think anybody really listens to these. I think they watch me and go, these guys are lying. And they don't pay attention to what's being said. They just like, oh, they look uncomfortable. But to the uneducated body, you know, body language and behavior, um, uh, what, what do you call those people? Uh, a person who's really into it. What do you call that person? Uh, Aficionado. Enthusiast. Oh, yeah. Enthusiast. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you call a body language enthusiast who's into it and wants to learn and wants to know. They think they're seeing things that we've told them or somebody else has told them that's given them valid information. They think what they're seeing, which is what they're seeing here, but it's not in the proper context. So a lot of these things that are they're being refuted to be to and are being said to be fake, these are explained like in this simple little, little thing here. So I I think that's really important. I'm gonna I'm gonna leave it right there for that one, uh, Mark. Yeah. You got? Uh, look, for, if he's lying, then he was just handed like a, a great thing to run with, which is the, inter, the the questioner said, look, the moon, sometimes it's emotionally bad. And then other times it's like emotionally happy. Like, what do you think of that? If you were trying to weave a story for somebody, you'd, you'd dive right into that and go, yeah, it's a dark horrific place and then suddenly you're in this world of beauty and joy so he goes into a, a logical description of how the sun's movement will change the aspect and the the tonality of the light it's like that's really bad propaganda that's really <laughs> bad that is if you're trying to lie like you're doing a bad bad job of it you should have 
run with that feeling and sold the emotional story to the audience. And they would just, it would be such a more interesting interview for a start. And so they'd start propagating that interview even more. And they'd go, come on this talk show and do that whole bit about the the earth, the, the, the moon being evil sometimes. And then like, like an angel other times, do that bit because the audience loved that. No, it's a, it's a terrible interview, which is very tedious and boring, but honest because my guess is it's to get to the moon. It's a pretty tedious and boring thing. If you want to get there and back again and not die, right? There's not a lot of fun to it. I, I assume you have to just do operational procedure again and again and again. And, and you know, they maybe got some moment to bounce up and down and have a bit of fun. But the rest of it just must have been pretty grim, I would think. Anyway, that's all I got on that one. Let's have another. I heard you can play like, back four in zero gravity, you know, during the downturn. Right. Do I? Can't yes. play Connect Four, Solitaire, Scrabble. Oh. <laughs> yeah, probably nothing to do up there while they're waiting to get up there. Probably just, just bored, I would think. You know, the one thing that hasn't changed from the very first show to this one has not changed one iota. One little bit. And if you go through those, those videos and watch them, you know the one thing that has stayed solid, that has stayed uh, just like the beacon of unchanging. Do you know what it was? Mark. Mark has always looked the same. Same background, same. Uh, True, he had his know, space already. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Suits up. Yeah. yeah. The only thing's changed a little bit in your hair, and your hair get longer and shorter. You have to understand it's I, I, I've moved house twice and I've just rebuilt this in every place. Oh, nice. Ah, nice. Nicely yeah. done. Yeah. Just ships now, just ships wherever it's I create. What do they call those, those houses? A crate home or tiny crate home? home. Yeah, 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 yeah. Tiny house. Yeah. Yeah. Tiny yeah. home. Actually, this nice is job. probably this might might be the size of a of a crate. It's about what mine is. Yeah, yeah. Like. I know Chase's background is the fake background. Yeah, um, yeah. for That's, yours, Chase. He's, he's got his own moon landing going on there. Yeah, yeah it's got a thing back there. <laughs> I'm simulating the sun setting. There. That's, That's yeah. expensive. That's it is expensive. not cheap. That's but if you want to, if you want to convince a world, that's what you have to spend, and you will spend that money. I'm struck uh, from the movies and the still pictures by the difference in the very hostile appearance of the moon when you're orbiting over it or some distance from it and the uh, warmer colors and the relatively, apparently relatively more friendly appearance of it when you're on the surface. I'd like to ask Colonel Collins if he gets that same impression from the pictures and uh, the two of you who were on the moon, what impression you have along those lines. Well, the moon uh, changes character as the uh, angle of sunlight striking its surface changes. At uh, very low sun angles, close to the terminator, or dawn or at dusk, it has the, uh, the harsh uh, forbidding characteristics which uh, you see in a lot of the photographs. On the other hand, when uh, the sun is more closely uh, overhead, the midday situation, the, the moon is uh, takes on more of a of a brown color, uh, almost a or becomes uh, almost a, a rosy looking place, a, a fairly friendly place. So that from uh, from dawn through uh, midday through dusk, you you run the, the, the whole gamut. Of it starts off very forbidding, becomes friendly, and uh, then becomes forbidding again as the sun. I have two brief questions I'd like to ask, if I may. When you were carrying out that incredible moonwalk, did you find that the surface was equally firm anywhere, or were there harder and softer spots that you could detect? And secondly, when you looked up at the sky, could you actually see the stars and the solar corona in spite of the glare? In, in rather flat regions, uh, the, the uh, footprint would penetrate perhaps a half an inch or sometimes only a quarter of an inch and gave a very firm response. In other regions near the edges of these craters, uh, we could find that the foot would, would sink down maybe two, three, possibly four inches. And in, in the slope, of course, the uh, various edges of the footprint would might go on up to six or seven inches, and uh, compacting this material would, would tend to uh, produce a slight sideways motion as it was compacted on the material underneath it. So uh, we feel that uh, you, you cannot always tell just by looking at the terrain what the exact resistance will be as your foot sinks into a, a point of firm contact. So one must be quite cautious.
cautious in, in moving around in this rough terrain. We were never able to see stars from the lunar surface or on the daylight side of the moon by eye without looking through the optics. Uh, I don't recall during the period of time that we were photographing the Sona Perla what, uh, what stars we could see. I don't remember seeing any. All right, Mark, what do you got? All right, I'll leave the astronauts to you guys because the most important thing here is obviously Sir Patrick Moore, uh, a, a British legend who made astronomy something that everybody in Britain would stay up all night in order to watch his late night show, which would often be live, and he'd get out there and he'd start pointing out the stars. He is a British eccentric and uh, one of our greatest legends of science broadcasting. So great to see him there. Uh, what an incredible voice, uh, which which comes from his RAF days, I think. That is a classic RAF um, pilot. I thought he was going to go, voice. out damn spot. I thought he was going <laughs> to right. right. Yes, yeah, so there is something kind of Shakespearean about him. He started wearing a monocle at a very early age. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, he had a monocle in there. Those. And you'd have this kind of, you, you know, one of the eyes closed like this and just being incredibly excited about about everything in the sky. And so people would just tune in to this because it was just so exciting to hear somebody just so excited about about just blackness with little moments of light in there. Just fantastic. Uh, awesome. Chase, what do you got on this one? <laughs> well, at least he's not dramatic. <laughs> right. Uh I'll have to say, Buzz's answer looks flowing, smooth, and honest. His hands are illustrating and narrating exactly and precisely in time with the speech. His fidgeting is significantly reduced. Uh, if I'm playing devil's advocate uh, here, the only thing in this clip that I can remember, because we just watched about three seconds of it because we kind of took notes this morning, uh, with this question about the stars, I did notice that Neil chose to answer his question specifically in a way that would we might call avoidant, which is weird. He specifically qualifies the answer to specific points of time where the stars were not visible. Uh, then when he's talking about the period of uh, photographing the solar corona, he changes the answer to specifically discuss which stars they could see, not the stars, but he says, I can't recall which stars we could see. And he doesn't mention that the stars were visible or not, which was the question. Uh, gestures are a little bit mismatched here. They're not in sync with his words or phrases. And we're talking about Neil here. So it's not a huge cluster, but uh, it's, it's all I can do uh, playing devil's advocate here. Uh, Scott, what do you got? All right. What he's talking about there is they're looking at the solar corona. Right. This is one of those big things where they say, well, you can't see the stars in any of the pic. Go outside at nighttime, put your camera up there. If you got a normal camera or your phone, take a picture. See how many stars you get. Not gonna be very many. But in the, there's a daytime on the moon and a nighttime on the moon. A lot of people call the other side, the far side of the moon, they'll call it the dark side of the moon. And that's actually incorrect because it's just the far side of the moon. And the the light there, there's no atmosphere to mess with the light, you know, to scatter it so it goes everywhere, so you can see the, the stars better when it's nighttime on the far side of the moon. So when you're looking at, at the uh, solar corona, which is what they were doing, trying to see what that looked, they're, they're much closer to the, the sun at this point than we've ever been before, so they want to see what's going on in the sun. So they're looking at the corona of the sun. They're, so th as they're looking at the sun, they're not going to be able to see stars out there because they're looking during the brightest part of the moon day, or however you'd say it. So that's why they're not seeing any stars. Nobody takes that into consideration. He explains why they don't see them in this in, in this part right here, in this question right here, as we're looking. And, and then Colin says, I don't remember seeing any of them while they're while they're looking at the, the, the corona. So that makes complete sense. So during the during the daytime, you can see you, you can't see the stars well at all. But at nighttime, they're really clear, really clear. So I'll leave it there because that's all I want to bring up on that part. Greg, what do you got? Collins is the only guy who saw the dark side of the moon because he was circling the moon. You know, these guys the were the far in, side on, of the moon. Okay. <laughs> it's always in the opposite Save your direction. Comments. We'll leave it at that. <laughs> we'll leave it at that. So he's the only guy who was seeing that. <clears throat> What's interesting, Chase, I'll give you another thing to add to your cluster since you're playing devil's advocate. At the end, when Collins says, I don't, don't help him, seeing, I don't recall seeing, he gives him an irritated look like, 
What would you know? You weren't on the ground. Almost something. There's a little irritated look as he turns his eyes to him. Maybe yeah. there's the whole thing is unraveling here. Don't think so. Because I would say this is the single best question we've heard yet to debunk this thing. Because he's asking him a hard question. He would have had to make up something mm. on the fly if he hadn't thought of it. And watch that brow up as I think it's Armstrong who's saying, do you get me, as he's talking about the whole thing. This cadence, this is the most excited we've seen Buzz Aldrin in the entire thing. His cadence, his hands moving, his consistency with the way he's speaking. He's actually animated as much as we're going to see him in this. I love that great handoff at saying, I don't remember seeing any when he hands off that thing over to Collins. But then that weird look back at Collins when he does answer it, Chase, maybe we're on to something. That's what I got. <laughs> I don't think you are. <laughs> <laughs> I have two brief questions I'd like to ask, if I may. When you were carrying out that incredible moonwalk, did you find that the surface was equally firm anywhere, or were there harder and softer spots that you could detect? And secondly, when you looked up at the sky, could you actually see the stars and the solar corona in spite of the glare? In, in rather flat regions, uh, the, the uh, footprint would penetrate perhaps a half an inch or sometimes only a quarter of an inch and gave a very firm response. In other regions near the edges of these craters, uh, we could find that the foot would, would sink down maybe two, three, possibly four inches. And in, in the slope, of course, the uh, various edges of the footprint would might go on up to six or seven inches, and uh, compacting this material would, would tend to uh, produce a slight sideways motion as it was compacted on the material underneath it. So uh, we feel that uh, you, you cannot always tell just by looking at the terrain what the exact resistance will be as your foot sinks into a, a point of firm contact. So one must be quite cautious in, in moving around in this rough terrain. We were never able to see stars from the lunar surface or on the daylight side of the moon by eye without looking through the optics. Uh, I don't recall during the period of time that we were photographing the Sona Perla what uh, what stars we could see. I don't remember seeing any. All right. So are they full of it? Was the moon landing faked? Mark, what do you think? Uh, look, as far as I can see from everything that I'm seeing here, these are people describing something that they actually did in that position, not on Earth and on the moon. So... From, from all I can see here, they went to the moon, and I would suspect as well the six other times that the U.S. did missions, they got on the moon as well. As you well know, there wasn't just one time uh, we went to the moon. There's right. been six times. Uh, Chase. At this period in time, the U.S. government is the number one organization in the world that can manage psychological propaganda. Number one. And if this was one of them, they did a horrible job. And this is a bad piece of propaganda. One thing we are, or I'm definitely seeing here is internal conflict about some of the things that are said, a little bit of resignation, and maybe just being a little bit of uh, kind of a standoff and, and not being willing, uh, maybe because they weren't able to say what they wanted to say. The reasons for some of the possible stress and reservation, uh, depression or disagreement that we're seeing here. They maybe have been forced to say some kind of scripted format. The details of the mission might have been changed a little bit for national security or whatever reason, and they were forced to say something that was different. Or there's a secret alien moon base on the other side of the moon, and they can't talk about it. You never know. Greg, what do you think? When I think about how people communicate, it's usually based on input. So I would say you're not who you are, you're who other people think you are. And the amount of data that you're getting from all of those inputs changes the way you perceive self, your speech patterns, all those things. We can see it when a person faces trauma and that kind of thing. Imagine for just one minute that your eyes were open to something that no one on earth had ever seen, no understanding, no other person ever had the understanding that you had. How would you go about trying to explain that to them, especially if your communication style is one that's very technical? Now, plot those people down in front of the biggest, the biggest names in the world and expect them to behave exactly like they did three weeks before when they had never seen the moon up close or walked on the moon, I think is a real stretch. 
And so it's really easy for us to assign weirdness to that. Of course, it's weird. There are three people who've been to the moon. Three. Three of the entire Earth's population. You said it first, Scott. What do you got? Yeah, I think everything looks the way it should here. I think they're being honest. I don't see anything that that even hinted to toward deception for me. Everything looked real. Everything looked like they'd been there. When you're talking to to anyone about where would y'all just go? We went to the mountains and here's what happened. No kidding. How was Gatlinburg? Yeah, a lot of tourists, but this, that, and the other thing. How was Nashville? Did you go to Broadway? Yeah. And they just went ahead and just explained it like it like it happened. So for me, I didn't see any problem whatsoever with any of that. I thought it went really well. I think everything went really well with that. So, all right. Thanks for another good one, fellas, and we'll see you next time. The Behavior Panel. All right. What else you know, we got to talk guys, about? I, I, I really didn't want to do this one because I thought it's just so dry. You ask about it so okay. often, though. Yeah, I know. I agree great. with you. I agree with you. I've had it marked for two years, I, but just thought. If I didn't do that, Oh, we oh, no, exactly. If you didn't do yeah. that, we no, that was perfect. boring. Thanks. That was perfect. Yeah. What, uh, what, I'm, what I'm going to love seeing is just how many people go, well, yeah, well, Chase is spot on. He's nailed <laughs> it. <It's like> <laughs>